In preparing for this exhibition, uh, which has been personally extremely rewarding, and you know, as I've said in other places, you know, it, it took three years for this exhibition to occur, but or to be created. But I've been waiting for this my entire life, and um, there is, you know, when I look back at, at at playing games and understanding what they meant to me as a kid and somebody growing up, uh, trying to understand what computers meant in the world and the ability to tell stories and to to interact. Um, there was a system that before my Commodore VIC-20, which allowed me to program, although I did try to program BASIC on it, Nolan, there was a system called the Atari VCS. Now, for those of you who grew up in that era, it is the VCS, not the 2600. <laughs> so let's make sure that we're saying this appropriately. And it was created by a company called Atari. Nolan Bushnell is the founder of Atari. And of course, as I said, a key player in the growth and popularity of the very first video games. He's going to discuss how far video games have come and how it all started. Um, I got a chance to get to know Nolan a bit better through the interview process uh, for the materials we had in the exhibition. And uh, it's a, some of the most, all of the, ex the interviews actually uh, for this project turned out to be some of the most insightful uh, and very personal interviews I've ever conducted or ever been a part of with so many of my friends in the games industry. Um, and it was just, I have no other way to say it, Nolan, but it just kind of transported me back to being that kid again and kind of, you know, understanding the amount of myself that I wanted to pour into the games. And to that end, Nolan signed this for me. So... What, you, what you're looking at, this is actually a Pong system board from probably 1971. And on the board it says Syzygy, which was actually the name of Atari before it was Atari. And so, Nolan, this is, uh, has a huge uh, place of importance within my personal collection. And uh, I thank you so much for taking the time not only to, uh, to sign this, but to have helped create you know, the machines that let us explore the wonder that we had growing up playing video games and for all your contributions to uh, not only the games industry, but to the world at large through these things you were able to bring to light. I welcome to the stage, Mr. Nolan Bushnell. You know, I think we can have some fun. What, one of the great things about the video game business is a lot of times you can't tell when you're working and when you're playing. And, uh, and it just bugs the hell out of my wife because, you know, I'll be in playing a game and she'll say, don't you have something to do? I said, well, I'm working. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and, and for those of you who aren't married, trust me, that's just part of the dynamic. Um, <laughs> That board that was laid out was laid out by the same guy that did the computer lay the board layout for the Apple I, Ron Wayne. And I, 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 I had forgotten about that link until just now, and I just thought I should bring that along. The early days of video games, we didn't call them that. The first time I heard video game, was at the trade show after we'd already sort of built one. Started my career as a carny. I worked at Lagoon, and uh, it's an amusement park about halfway between Salt Lake and Ogden, Utah. And we had regular stuff. And I was work pursuing an engineering degree at the University of Utah. Going into the actual formation, this is Willie Higginbotham's ping, uh, Tennis for Two. And it was played on this screen, and it was relays and capacitors and oscilloscope. And that's really the first time anybody played any kind of a game on a, on a, using computer components in a display, to my knowledge. I really think that's the, the big one. This is my professor, 
Dr. Evans of Evans and Sutherland, and if that rack of equipment that you're seeing is actually a video processor, each one of those cards, wait for it, it's a flip-flop. It had the blinding speed of 100 kilohertz. And uh, there is more compute power in a typical watch than there is here, let alone the iPhone or any of these other things. <laughs> then we come to MIT, the PDP-1, and the foundation of what I consider to be the real foundation of the video game business, and that's with Steve Russell, who, if anybody should be considered to be the father of the video game, it's him. He did a thing on the PDP-1, 100 kilohertz clock speed, XY display, funner than hell. That was where I got involved in it, because this was basically on the, on the circuit. Anybody, any university that had a big computer, whether it was a PDP-1 or not, if they had a video display, they played this game. And at that time, there were baseball games, and I pr personally programmed a game in 1965 on this computer that uh, was called Fox and Geese. And I later programmed a game uh, that was a little bit like American football, but really lame. Um, and, and what you don't realize is that there was sort of an underground, and they were on punch cards. There was a deck of them that was like this. And if you dropped them, you were really hosed. And, uh, and it could take you a week to get them back in the right position. This is what the computer looked like. This is a PDP-1. And uh, took air conditioning, had great big thing in the back. And this was kind of, this is what the world was like. Um, and uh, to think that you could go from there to something that was commercial was a little bit foolhardy. But uh, in 1969, this was the state of the arcade business. And this was a game, a driving game, and it, was, it consisted of, of like electromechanical slide projectors. And this was the image, and the, and the thing spun around, and it looked like the road was turning. And it was fun. That thing made a lot of money. And then, this is what the technology was. Not a solid state device in place. These are all re relays and various things. And to keep it running was really hard. They were Rube Goldbergs. Then there was a thing called Computer Quiz. This is another slide projector. This was a trivia game. Not a computer in sight. Uh, but it called it, except for the name. Um, and uh, that's kind of the state of the thing. Then, then I had this big idea one day when a mini computer came across my desk for $5,000. And I thought, wow, I'm going to do Space War on, you know, for an amusement park arcade. And my idea was I was going to have four screens with four coin slots, because the, the games cost about $1,000. And I figured, amusement park, that sort of thing. And I started down that pathway, and the computers were so slow that I could, they couldn't refresh fast enough. And so I kept building these little circuits that would take over in hardware what, what the computer couldn't do. And I'd keep running out of time, re running out of time, and I finally abandoned the project. This was in the fall. This was, you know, I was going to try to get things really done by the, Christ uh, the Thanksgiving holidays. And then I had the epiphany. Throw the mini computer away. And it turns out all the hardware to interface with the computer, it made it really easy, and then 
we got the circuits going and bingo. And then to make things even worse, there's such a thing as too much innovation. Um, I decided to do a fiberglass cabinet. I molded it out of modeling clay and that sort of thing. And, uh, and when we took it to the trade show, man, everybody was baffled. They, had, they didn't know what to think about it. Uh, the girl in the brochure was a stripper that was down the street, <laughs> which is a whole nother story. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is the sort of the core team. Uh, this is Ted. He was my partner. We worked together and did computer space. This was Fred, who was our first CFO who got fired under a cloud. And this is Al Alcorn, a really, really smart guy. And in fact, I get so much credit for stuff that Al did. Um, but I get the credit because I had the polka dot shirt. <laughs> Magnavox Odyssey came along about the same time. And, uh, and it turns out that Magnavox, you know, I'd been in the, the only guy in the video game business for about two years. And all of a sudden I heard, they got a video game in Burlingame. Well, it scared me. Had to go check it out. I went up and played the game. I thought, boy, this is really lame. Uh, but I looked at some of the other people and they were kind of having some fun with it. So I thought, well, our technology was crisper, more defined, a lot of cooler stuff, and so I needed to have something. And it turned out that exactly the same day that I saw the Magnavox game was Al Alcorn's first day on the job. And he needed a training program, a project. So I said, describe the game, did it. Remember, we uh, we played, you know, ping pong games on the big computers before, but now, all of a sudden, this training project came, and we did Pong, and then we did com Consumer, and you know all the rest, the Atari VCS, all that stuff. The Atari VCS was really the triumph of engineering and cost reduction over good sense. Um, the, uh, the Atari VCS had 128 bytes of RAM. That's not very much. <laughs> and, and we, when we, di when we did it, we thought that the, we had a list of 16 or 18 games that we thought could be done on the, on the VCS. And we thought we could do those 18 games, sell the cartridges for them, and then we were going to upgrade. Because memory was very expensive. And we all knew that the minute we could do a bitmap of the screen, that all hell would break loose. Because it just turns out that you have a lot of time, because not a lot of the screen is changing. So if you're only focusing on the changing bits, you're good. Well, it turns out that guys like Dave Crane here were so damn smart that before we knew it, we had hundreds of games that were so much better. And our idea that we could only have 16 games was just totally bogus. In fact, one of the biggest mistakes I've made is we calculated that we would sell three cartridges per main unit, OK? So as a result, the initial production run, we had seven titles. Everybody who bought the 2600 bought every one of the titles. So if you were to, to buy the, the end of that first production run, you had no cartridges. You had the, the one that you got it with, and that was it. We figured that that, that decision, my decision, cost the company about 35 million bucks. <laughs> and that, uh, you know, when I think of all the stupid things I've done, 
I really wonder why I'm standing here. <laughs> oh, you know, I turned down a third of Apple computer for 50,000 bucks. Now, if you don't think that one hurts. <laughs> what a lot of people don't know is that Atari started out with no money, Nobody thought the video game business made any sense. It started out with no processes. It started out with a garage shop, which was a good thing because we could build Pong in a garage shop. The problem was anybody else that had a garage shop could build a Pong too. Of the 150,000 Pong games that were sold, Atari only did about 30,000 of them. We got out whacked in our own business. And we decided that the only way that we were going to survive, because everybody else had factories. They could actually build stuff in big numbers. And I can remember Al Alcorn, when I told him we were going to go to 100 Pongs a day, he thought I was absolutely nuts. I said, well, if you can't do it, I'll find somebody that can. And he found a way to do it. That was my tricky way of, that, that's, that's, that's about as mean as I get. Um, but we out-innovated them. And ultimately, one by one, we bankrupted every one of our coin-op competitors except the really big guys. How did we do it? We tricked them. Video games, coin-operated games, have a very short life cycle. Six months, maybe a year. And so, Anybody who was copying us, they would have a certain lead time. And we figured out that if we could mess with their brain, it would work. So get this. We had the semiconductor guys mismark some of the parts. But with part numbers that represented a different chip. And so anybody who was copying us, they'd copy our board, they'd buy the parts, they'd plug them in, boards wouldn't work. <laughs> Hopefully by that time, they'd fill their factory full of cabinets and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> and if they copied the wrong game that had a short thing, all of a sudden by the time they got it figured out, there was no mark. Meadows game, toast. Remember that one? We had the temerity to buy a case of champagne when they declared bankruptcy <laughs> and had a party around their front sign. <laughs> we were young, exuberant. Anyway, if you can't have fun, why not? So creativity became a serious defensive weapon. And how do you really get creativity? You, you drop risk or you be willing to fail. Figure out a way to keep failure from being deadly. And so we figured out ways to fast track. We invented just-in-time inventory before anybody did. And it worked like a charm. And this is where I started and said, any idiot who has ever had a shower has had a good idea. <laughs> it's what you do when you get out of the shower that matters. And I, I want to make sure that everybody knows that. <laughs> the spark of innovation is more than just a light bulb going off. It's starting to own your idea. And how do you start to own it? You start by having the idea in the shower. When you get out, you write it down. You start researching it. You find out if there's competition. You start figuring out the economics. You figure out how, the, how it works in the marketplace. And slowly but surely, 
you walk up to where pretty soon you start to own the idea. Anybody that says, somebody stole my idea, I says, no, they didn't. You wasted your idea by sitting on your butt. You don't own the idea until you, you capitalize on it. Who knows what this is? Bingo. <laughs> this just happens to be one of my favorites, and I just thought, this is really crappy graphics. <laughs> but you kind of know what's going on. Big explosions, cities that we're defending, missile command posts. And there's an interesting question that I want to ask you all in your design of video games. When is enough enough in terms of the graphics? Because tournament chess players will never, ever play with anything other than the standard game, because they don't want any ambiguity introduced into the game in terms of the sh shape of the pieces. I'm sure you've all played chess with a, game, with a thing that, where the pawns look like bishops. You know, not a fun game. So what we did, all our games, were, incidentally, were casual early on. Remember this puppy? got to tell you a story on this one. We hooked up a coin-op version of combat, which was called tank, and we put electrodes in the handles. <laughs> and, and whenever you'd get hit, you'd get a shock. We thought that was really a cool idea. <laughs> and we thought, well, maybe some people won't like it. And so we put, we put a knob where you could sort of wager your pain. <laughs> All the way from zero to pretty painful. In market tests, we found out we might as well put a switch, because people were either all in or all out. <laughs> but the other thing we found is that just even though they could turn the switch off, the revenue in the coin-op world on that machine was about a third of what one that didn't have that feature on it. Which said to me that people didn't want to wimp out by turning it off. They just say, oh no, I don't play that game. Interesting psychology, the wimps. This is a game that is so baffling, I, I don't know why. <laughs> David, sitting down here, you've heard, heard his stuff. But David is a uh, great human being and, and one of the brilliant game designers who Ray Kassar pissed off. But that's another story. And he went off to Activision. It's what I call an alienation of affection. You know this one? Great game. Did you know that Namco purchased Atari Japan? That's how they got in the video game business? It turns out that we were young and dumb, and we had problem getting distribution in Japan, as a lot of companies do. So we said, OK, we'll just go set up our own not realizing there's such thing as currency controls and things like that. We basically took suitcases full of dollars over there and turned them and, and got the thing going. Took about a year for the Japanese government to figure us out. And we were in violation of about 140,000 laws. <laughs> so we decided we better sell this puppy and get out while the getting's good or we will find ourselves in some kind of a Japanese prison. The, uh, and we sold it to Namco, and, uh, and they, they did pretty good with, with it. At, uh, we sold it to him in 1975, and, uh, 
And of course, they made so much money on breakout. I shouldn't tell this story, but I'm going to. <laughs> um, we had the deal where we would ship them circuit boards, and they'd put them into whole games, and, that, and so we'd make some profit on the circuit boards. Well, of course, they cheated and started making some of their own boards, and we figured that we sold about 10,000 circuit boards into Japan, and there were about 80,000 breakouts made in Japan. So I don't know why they thought we wouldn't find out, but we ended up getting a settlement, and anyway, that's another story. Of course, Namco did Pac-Man, and this was our wonderful version of it on the 2600. <laughs> Barely. If you really want to see a bad one, though, you, you should see E.T. <laughs> okay, now, this was after I left. <laughs> but when they released E.T., they released more cartridges than there were players. Now think about that for a minute. <laughs> when queried, the management said, well, we figure that some people are going to want to take the cartridge to their vacation house to play. And they're going to play it on what? And so anyway, that, the story of E.T. cartridges in, the, in cement in the Arizona desert, absolutely true. <laughs> More stuff. These, these are sort of the evolution of art. Uh, this is where we're getting into screen bitmap graphics. Remember this, this one? You know, the Sega did some great stuff. And... Uh, they got so successful that they forgot how to be humble. And it ended up crashing. Remember Marble Madness? Bomberman, one of my favorites. I was looking for a graphic on Bomberman. I couldn't find one, but it's there somewhere. All kinds of... This is a good one. This is... Tempest. This is one of my favorite ones. What was, the, what was unique about Tempest? Huh? The monitor. It was the first color vector monitor that Atari ever made, and it was virtually impossible to keep running. Because in order to get a color vector monitor, you have to use the, the phosphor triggers color based on the energy of the, the, the electron. And uh, so you're switching high, speed, high voltage at high speed. The sec semiconductors at that time really didn't like that at all. And so we, it was a great game, but boy, was it a nightmare. I love the game. Then we come into, who knows what this is? Mafia Wars. And you ask yourself, is this a game, or is it drudgery? I mean, did anybody else besides me start playing some of these social games, Mafia Wars, things like that, and you say, I'm tired of this. This is, this is work. This isn't fun. After I... <laughs> oh. But understand, this was after I'd played it for about a month. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. You know, I was trying to figure out what the thing was, and yeah, did I get sucked in? I did, but I was really mad at myself. <laughs> Mafia Wars. Then we have SimCity. And, you know, SimCity was a great game. Love Will Wright, good guy. Look at this one. I mean, this is good stuff. And then we have Farmville. And, uh, and, you know, <laughs> which one made the most money? 
it's absolutely amazing to me that, and, and this, is, this is a lesson that I really want you guys who love video games to look at. Many times, if you innovate the economic model, it's more important than innovate anything on the screen, anything in the gameplay. Because by all normal standards at this space in our game, this is a pretty lame game. But it's doing really well. And you say, why? And it re-engaged a whole set of people that were not game players. It was not taxing. Didn't, you know, you could say the collective wisdom of the American population is dropping, or not. But at the same time, I found myself kind of having some fun with it. Like right now, I've got almost all the dragons. <laughs> There's a couple of them that are hard. No matter what you do to breed them, the egg comes out wrong. So don't, don't play this game. <laughs> we have Madden. I mean, look at this. This is... This screen right here is why I do not believe there will be a next generation console. Why? I believe it is really bad marketing to say that my photorealism is better than your photorealism. And that's pretty damn good. I mean, the difference between that and an HD rendering of that same image is de minimis. So to spend $300 on a go-fast processor that will overheat and break, that was a nod to the X-Bar. <laughs> um, we can have some fun with this. But look at this. This is really good stuff. And the fact that you can get pixels and mesh to, to do this, I just... I know how hard this stuff is, and I couldn't do it, and I, my hat's off to the genius that is the video game business today. Isn't that wonderful? I'm, I'm just proud that I had a little bit of part to it, but these guys have just gone hog-ass wild. <laughs> now, it turns out that I have the patent on this, or had it. It was a game called Stompin', and the idea was to squish spiders. Didn't do nearly as well as this puppy. <laughs> uh, and, uh, yeah. <laughs> Which is more fun, this or Dance Dance Revolution? <laughs> Thank you very much, but the, uh, the, the vote has already been taken, and, and, and <laughs> <laughs> of course we have the Wii, great product. I was probably one of the only guys that, that projected that the Wii was going to be better and more successful than the Sony PlayStation 3. Yeah! And are, are you for the white Wii or for the PlayStation? We, <laughs> okay. <laughs> What, what really, it, and what's, what's the, why was the Wii so successful? Was it the gesturing? No, because it reset the whole dynamic. A lot of people just can't deal with the, today's keyboard. The controller of, a, of an Xbox of that is, is it's too high a learning curve. The Wii had one button, motion, boom. I can tell you, one button works pretty well. <laughs> and, <laughs> and the activity, and you know, and anytime you can advertise with a pretty girl, you're going to do something. <laughs> um, bring all the family in and, you know, you break each other's noses. That's always a good, <laughs> that's a good family act activity. Let's talk about some of the crazy stuff coming. What is this? This is a new kind of contact lens. 
naturally imprints an image on your retina. Looks a little bit like that. And all of a sudden, virtual reality comes into place. This is a game for a group of people, real cheap. You can do a uh, whole uh, desk platter now. This thing costs less than a thousand bucks. The one from Microsoft is about five grand, six grand. And uh, but they'll get there. And then of course the accelerometers, the iPhone, the 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 uh, gyroscopes in the iPhones really represent a whole new thing that you can do. And the part, some of the things that we're working on right now are mesh networks. Mesh networks can set up micro cells for game playing. So think about the dynamic of being on a New York subway and all of a sudden being able to engage everybody that's in the, cu in the car for a little game experience and then move away. These can be really fun. You know, uh, like while people are waiting for a movie to start, while people are waiting for a boring lecture like this. You know, you could be playing games or something valuable. Geolocation is really fun and where you create these loose networks of game playing and kill them. Um, I mean, if you know where they are, you should be able to shoot them somehow. <laughs> then you have synthetic or augmented reality. It turns out that you don't realize it, but this whole damn museum is infested with evil monkeys. <laughs> and the only way you can see them is through the, your virtual Netscape. This is what they look like. And you can grow them, you can kill them, or they will kill you. <laughs> Turns out that there's all kinds of interesting game structures now for public places. This is a game, a really cool game. And uh, I believe that you're going to start seeing a lot more of this. This is a game. This also happens to be a Burning Man. How many of you have been to Burning Man? OK. Yeah, but it's worth it. If somebody were to say that you can go to Venus and it's made almost a, a good temperature, but closer to Venus than the United States. Uh, it, Burning Man is really worth it. Because what you really want to do is a totally bizarre experience with naked women and drugs. <laughs> no, I, I'm just teasing. It's, uh, <laughs> there's a lot of art there. Physical experiences are the next big thing, where we weave a narrative in with a video game experience along with a physical puzzle. And we're working on some of these. The company's name is Versix, and it'll be coming to a theater near you. This is a, my current project in what I call the iMovie space. And it's a movie that you play. It's for 100 people. You uh, come in, you sit down, and there's this damn evil queen who is a witch. She has banished the, the princess to a tower. The tower is in quicksand. If you don't rescue the princess, she's toast. She's also very beautiful. Turns out that you, or the, 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 the prince who is going to go rescue the princess, has to recruit an army, which just happens to be in the audience. And you 
as the audience members, have to help solve the problems that, they, that the evil queen is setting up in this quest to go through. There are 10 game intervals tied together by a machine of a movie. And if the audience is diligent, they can save the princess. It was very beautiful. <laughs> the, uh, Augmented reality <laughs> has a dark underside. <laughs> but this is what you're going to see in the next few years. And uh, it's, uh, I'm sorry for doing this, but I, I was trying to. <laughs> of course, we have the iPad doing good stuff. Uh, I should do a call out of some of my favorite games, but I won't. The future's yours. Um, understand that everybody today has power that we didn't even think of in the, 60, in the, in the 70s and the 80s. Almost anybody can kickstart a product, put a couple of your friends together, and make a million dollars. Have you ever heard of Minecraft? Great game, simple, done by a very small group. They've made, what, 300 million bucks so far? You know, this is really the time for the individual entrepreneur. And all you have to do is believe you can do it and have a good idea. Narrative, I talked about that. I mean, we all know where we're going. It's Westworld. <laughs> um, and you just have to keep the the, the non-player characters from going evil. <laughs> there was a great scene in that, but I'm not going to talk about it. And that's kind of it. What I want to make sure everyone knows is how much fun it is to live a life in which you can't tell the difference between your work and your play. The video game business allows you to do that. And you're bringing happiness to a lot of people. And, and the, the technology is really powerful. I'm currently working on a couple of projects. Go into brainrush or, or speedtolearn.com or wordplay. We believe that we can teach high school curriculum, four years worth of high school curriculum in about six months using game technology. Can you imagine what it'd be like to go to high school and never have a minute that you're bored? I believe that that's not only possible, but it turns out that when you're not bored, things get sticky. The other thing is that when you are having fun, you're more receptive to learning. When you're curious, when you're getting it right there, and, and we can create a brain map of everything that you know. Scary, huh? And make sure that there is nothing presented to you in which you don't have the, the underlying fundamentals. Also, it turns out that if you train properly, that you can actually increase your IQ maybe as much as 15 points. And we're, I'm putting out some things. I'm, I'm turning into an author. I've written a book on video games 2071. This is a shameless promotion. <laughs> and, uh, and it's basically a, a book about, if I say technology, there's no constraints, what is the ultimate video game? And uh, it should be out sometime in June or July. And I want you to all download one or buy one and uh, contribute to the fact that I can really spend a lot of money when I have it. <laughs> but at the same time, 
I hope it'll, it'll make some thinking. There's also some great gratuitous sex in it. <laughs> the, uh, I've also got a book called Hyper-Ed, School of the Future. It's a little more serious, but fun nonetheless. And, uh, and I think that we can have a really great decade or two. Uh, 2071, which is the 100-year anniversary, is when I've sort of placed the, my characters. They're having a ball with video games. And, uh, and I think uh, society will, too. I'm not sure any, most of the people that are here are not going to last that long, but damn sure I won't. Uh, and uh, thanks for coming. Thank you.